Disclaimer. Per the Copyright Act of 1976, sections 106 and 107 to be precise, copyrighted content can be used under fair use. Because this show is overall educational, all of what I am doing is protected under fair use. Any copyright claims submitted by companies, third parties, or otherwise are consequently false and could be grounds for perjury. Thank you and have a nice day. Mountains, peaks, heights, humps, precipices, alps, buttes, palisades, sierras, prominences, ridges, domes, hills, the product of active orogenic activities. This episode will be about these monumental pyramids that jut into the sky like phallic symbols, daring to be hurled innuendos at their majestic structures. Now get your minds out of the gutter and watch this insanity unfurl in this ridiculous episode of... Hello and welcome to the Logo Corner, where the first two minutes of a movie make or break a logo's fame. Today, instead of talking about complex futuristic structures or well-groomed animals, we're going to journey through the great outdoors. Ah, breathe in that fresh air. But luckily we're not going on a massive hike. We are, however, going to stop and look at several mountains and discuss how they are relevant to this quirky logo show. Not sure why you signed up for this particular nature walk, but I suppose I can't complain. Today, the theme of this episode is, based on the obvious hints of course, the Paramountain. Paramount, like MGM and 20th Century Fox, has an extensive history with an impressive filmography to its name. Since its founding in 1912, although the company was not named Paramount until 1914, I'll explain that later, the many legendary movies that were produced under the mountain, so to speak, include hits such as Mission Impossible, Indiana Jones, The Godfather, The Bad News Bears, Beverly Hills Cop, Forrest Gump, the Star Trek movies, the Friday the 13th series, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, though I'm not really a big superhero movie movie person. Paramount is considered the fifth oldest movie studio in existence, after Galmont, Pathé, Nordisk, and Universal Studios, and I will talk about all of them in future episodes. Paramount was a mostly independent film studio until 1966, when they were acquired by the most unlikely of companies. This too will be discussed later. After several bouts of reorganization, Paramount's new owner became none other than... Viacom. Yes, Viacom, the company behind their infamous logo collection, which I will be sure to tackle later too. With trepidation, of course. Paramount's more than a century-long history is a study of constancy, simplicity, well, kind of, and loyalty to their audiences with their movies and their antique aesthetic, though I'm sure their Transformers movies are topics of debate. Enough controversy, on to the logos of Paramount Pictures and the mountains themselves, since I know all of you are freezing to death in this frigid weather. As we trudge on, let me give you a little history lesson. Just like with 20th Century Fox, the story starts with another Hungarian immigrant, Adolf Zukor. Zukor, who was already affluent through prior business ventures, entered into the film business by lending money to his cousin, Max Goldstein who was involved in expanding theater chains. Zukor noticed the potential of the nascent movie business, and in 1912, he founded the famous Players Corporation with the financial backing of American Broadway theater owners Charles and Daniel Froman. By 1913, the company was successful with the release of several films starring actors and actresses that would achieve stardom later in their acting careers, such as Mary Pickford. The famous Players Corporation did come up with its own logo identity, though I was only able to find stills of the logo rather than a moving logo lifted from one of their actual films. Despite this, we do have a logo, and it's rather fascinating. Here we see the letters F, P, and F twisting around each other, going over and under their own fancy designs, encircled by what looks like a series of laurels. The inner circle that contains the letters is a dark sepia-toned brown. The two Fs also appear slightly off-center, but as I said previously, logos back then were rudimentary. 
The company did not last too long, as it was the subject of a merger in 1916 brokered by a rather eminent motion picture producer. Who was it? Find out next on... The Famous Players Lasky Corporation was the result of a merger between Famous Players and the feature play company founded by American motion picture producer Jesse L. Lasky. Lasky initially was a Broadway producer, in a time he inadvertently met future film director Cecil B. DeMille, until he became involved in film by 1913. Lasky was financially backed by his brother-in-law, who was, get ready for this, Samuel Goldwyn. Small world, isn't it? Anyways, with such backing, Lasky teamed up with DeMille to produce several feature films in Los Angeles. Lasky's company, named the Feature Play Company, was involved in a merger by 1916 with Zucor's Famous Players Company. As a result, the merger yielded the eponymous name Famous Players Lasky Corporation, because, well, Lasky owned the Feature Play Company. Jesse L. Lasky would later be responsible, alongside many others, in founding the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. There does not seem to be a concrete logo identity for either the Feature Play Company or the Famous Players Lasky Corporation, although I did find this flyer that features the name of the company prominently on it. Now hold on, you might be saying. Where is Paramount? Wasn't Paramount technically founded in 1912? And if not, when the hell was Paramount founded? Well, Paramount was brought into existence with the help of three founders. We already discussed Adolf Zukor and Jesse Lasky. We will now talk about the third, and by that point, everything will make more sense. Oy, now you're making things complicated, I hear all of you say. Why does Paramount claim to have been founded in 1912 when clearly you wrote that it was founded in 1914? Before you get out the pitchforks, just, just hear me out. Paramount Pictures Corporation was founded in 1914 by W.W. Hodkinson, who was another eminent film pioneer. Hodkinson's list of accomplishments include founding one of the first movie theaters in the country around 1907 and making it profitable over several years, then buying out his competitors, and then expanding his business to a nationwide level. Hodkinson's strong suit was film distribution, and sure enough, with some shrewd merging, he established, as I said already, Paramount. Paramount was the first national film distribution company, as opposed to other distribution companies which were only able to distribute locally. Hodkinson's moves would inspire other film distribution companies to do the same and achieve similar results. Besides leaving his imprint on film distribution, Hodkinson also left his imprint on the logo identity of the company. It is said that in 1914, during a meeting with Adolf Zukor, Hodkinson doodled the company logo on a napkin. Later on, the design would be refined for the movie screen, and this initial design is what Hodkinson came up with. As you can see, the logo appears awfully familiar. We see a mountain jutting out from the cumulus clouds below with the words Paramount Pictures floating above it in its distinct font, and of course, the circular band of stars that flank the logo and the mountain. There are 24 stars exactly, and each star represents an actor or actress that signed with the company. However, throughout Paramount's logo history, the number of stars would change over time. I'll get to that in a moment. In relation to the mountain, some people claim Hodkinson's mountain was inspired by Pikes Peak in Colorado, which was where Hodkinson was born. However, some people speculate that the mountain was based off Ben Lomond in Utah, and allegedly Hodkinson vacationed there on multiple occasions. Whether it may have been one mountain, the other mountain, or an amalgamation of the two mountains, the Paramount logo was born. And to Hodkinson's credit, it remained nearly the same throughout the lifespan of the company. Now, what does the famous Players Lasky Corporation have to do with Paramount? Well, remember when I mentioned that Hodkinson had talks with Adolf Zukor? That was because Zukor and Lasky were interested in Paramount, and its solid reputation as a successful film distribution company helped matters. The famous Players Lasky Corporation struck a deal with Paramount in 1913 to have their films distributed, and Hodkinson suggested a financial negotiation that seemed to be agreeable to all parties. Thus, we have our three founders, we have Paramount, and all is right with the world. Or is it? Well, Zukor and Lasky figured that they could gain more revenue if they integrated both the production arm of their company and the distribution arm, which meant that in order to do that, Hodkinson must be removed from the picture. By 1916, Zukor officially fired Hodkinson despite his contributions, and the famous players Lasky Corporation bought Paramount to become its parent company. And with that acquisition comes our first series of variants for Paramount, although they appear slightly inconsistent. 
The first variant of the logo is heavily based on the initial design rendered by Hodkinson. The mountain erupting from the clouds can be seen in the early variants with the 24 stars present. Usually the logo was filmed from a slide or card, which is why it appears shaky in the earlier forms of it. We see a definite contrast between the upper half and lower half of the logo as the upper half is black while the lower half is white with the font in the top half appearing white and the bottom half black. It produces a nice effect despite its rudimentary appearance. In addition, the logo would be accompanied by either Adolf Zukor Presents or Jesse Lasky Presents, depending on what coast the movie was produced. Here are some of the older Paramount logos I was able to find, reminding the faithful audience that I had to download entire freaking movies to find them, so you best appreciate them. Here they are in no particular order with appropriate bylines. Now we must continue our nature hike and visit the second Paramountain. Strap in for more star changes and mountain lookalikes. Around this time, the studio was facing troubles. Zucor not only bought out Hodkinson, but also kicked out Goldwyn. In addition, by 1932, Zucor even fired Lasky, blaming him for Paramount's horrendous luck during the Great Depression. This also meant the end of the famous player's Lasky Corporation, although Paramount officially went independent in 1927. By 1936, Paramount was reorganized under Zucor and the entire company was referred to as Paramount Pictures Inc. Why mention this piece of history here? This reorganization was reflected in this particular variant. No longer do we see the famous player's Lasky company byline in these logos. Instead, what we are treated to is a snow-capped mountain with the classic Paramount font, again surrounded by 24 stars. This logo has appeared in multiple forms with multiple backdrops and color palettes. Also, this mountain bears a striking resemblance to Mount Everest. Or maybe the Matterhorn. I'll be making lots of random mountain comparisons in this episode. Sometimes the logo was black and white. Be atoned. <laughs> and in color. And sometimes the film was a release, not a picture. There are plenty of other movie unique variants that I will show later in the episode, but those examples represent the general template. Although it is interesting to note that the mountain seems modest and not the center of attention. The font and the stars in these variants steal the show. Later on we'll see that future Paramountains will command our eyes, but for now, let us bask in the glory of this mountain's humility. And now, time for another quirky and weirdo logo variant. In conjunction with the Everest Mountain, Paramount made special variants for some of the shorts they released to theaters, such as Popular Science and Unusual Occupations. There are two sub-variants that I was able to find. The first one has the usual 24 stars and Paramount font, but the mountain looks completely different. This one bears more of a resemblance to the Matterhorn, but it looks ridiculously out of place in comparison to the rest of the logo. It was almost as if Paramount plastered the stars and font against this random mountain. In any case, here it is. The next one is even stranger. 
It's not the strangest out of step sub variant I came across, but it's certainly a spectacle. Not only is the font different, but the mountain looks more like a magnified anthill, and if not, a weathered Everest. What's most unusual is the star count. Last I checked, there are 19 stars in this variant. Why 19? I don't freaking know. Did they fire five of their stars? What's up with this thing, man? And just as a bonus, here's a still shot of the popular science variant with 30 stars. Clearly Paramount has high turnover. But if you thought those mountains were out of place and perhaps ugly to look at, try viewing the next variant. To be fair, this variant isn't as disorganized or as tacky as the popular science variant, but the mountain appears a bit off. Of course the blue colors used in this logo look nice and presages what is to come for Paramount, but this mountain looks like it has a terrible case of scoliosis. It looks like a crooked Matterhorn. Not to mention the logo appears plastered again, as part of it doesn't even connect to the other side of the mountain. At least we're back at an even 24 stars again. Thank goodness. This mountain was so well respected as it cameoed in one of DeMille's finest films, The Greatest Show on Earth. So okay, maybe this crooked Matterhorn had something or this crooked Pfeiffer horn, or whatever. However, the next mountain we are going to look at is a rather iconic one. We're going down to Latin America to visit the inspiration for our next variant. This variant was conceived and painted by Dutch matte artist Jan de Mella, who also made some wonderful landscape pictures. Said to have been inspired by Arte San Raju, a mountain located in Peru, this para mountain is the most detailed one yet with clear blue skies, forests and valleys surrounding this mountain, and the mountain itself jutting proudly into the sky, this variant, in my opinion, is the most iconic variant of Paramounts. Or, one of the more iconic variants, that is. Also, we still have 24 stars. Delightful. The logo was originally created for the new 3D process Paramount created called Paravision, but the variant ultimately stuck for future movie releases. However, like 20th Century Fox, Paramount entered into the world of widescreen with a little something they called VistaVision. And let me tell you, the logo for that spares no expense at being bombastic. And there were several variants of the VistaVision logo too. Here are some. In addition, we have the release Paramount as opposed to the pictures Paramount. But I think the most jarring variant of the Peru Mount era is the Psycho variant. Take a look at this. Short, but sweet. Although most of these logos swiftly appear and disappear. I wonder if it's a sign of the producer's foreknowledge of how amazing the associated movies are. Only those bigwigs truly know. Now during the Peru Mount era, there existed another form of the logo. The landscape didn't change, but the subtleties sure did. <laughs> 